Good afternoon, students. So, welcome to week eight. This is lecture 15, um, and we are going to be talking about tax incidents. And the reference chapter, or the prescribed chapter, is chapter 18 of Stiglitz and Rosengard. What we shall be looking at in this lecture is tax incidents in competitive markets, tax incidents in environments without perfect competition. Uh, equivalence of consumption and wage taxes. So how do these two taxes compare, consumption and wage taxes, and other factors that impact or affect tax incidents. And uh, we will be doing this in the context of the United States. As you will see, there is much theory in this chapter, unlike the previous few chapters, where it was more of a discussion of reality based on uh, empirical results or empirical observations presented. So we are back to looking at diagrams in this lecture. So that is what is to come. First of all, what we need to do is we need to define what is tax incident. So we start with this idea of a so-called tax burden. And what exactly is the definition of a tax burden? The tax burden is the true economic weight of a tax. It is the difference between the individual's real income before and after the tax has been imposed. After accounting of how wages and prices would have adjusted. So for example, if we look at it from that perspective, let's say that you earn a hundred pounds. So that is your real income before tax. And after tax, what happens is if you have 90 pounds, then what we have is a tax burden of 10 pounds. Now, incidence is a little bit, or tax incidence specifically, is a little bit more nuanced. And that is what we need to talk about. Here, what we ask ourselves, who is it that actually pays a tax in that sense that real income is lowered? So think about it this way. So you have a company which employs a number of people and uh, that company has to pay social security and it also has to pay a corporate tax. What is the result of that? Well, the, those payments result in lower wages. Even though a wage might be stated before tax, it is already lower due to the fact that a corporation needs to pay social security payments and also it needs to pay corporate taxes. So hence, it pays less to its employees. Then on top of that, what happens is that employees pay income tax. So therefore, while the burden appears to just be the income tax, the tax incidence is higher because the wages are lower because of corporate taxes, which means that companies have less profits or less income after adjusting for taxes, and also security, social security that must be paid by a firm. So hence, the tax incidence will differ from the tax burden. And the incidence of taxes depends on a number of factors, most important on whether the economy is competitive and, if competitive, on the shape of the demand and supply curves. Therefore, we go back to this discussion of market structure. In summary, what we can say is that tax incidence refers to how the division of taxes falls on both the employee and the employer, or I'll turn to the firm and the consumer. So we talk about the division, and that division is different than just looking at a consumer's income and saying, well, that is the level of tax. No, because the level of tax is also impacted about how a firm is taxed. So that is when the nuance comes in, and that is dependent upon market structure. So let's begin in panel A, in a situation where what we have is we have competitive markets. In other words, the price is equal to the marginal cost. Now, what determines the supply curve? The supply curve is impacted by the costs of production. What happens if we impose a tax? So assume that we start initially here, and then we impose a tax represented by small t. So we add that to the marginal cost. What is the result of that? The result of that is that the supply curve shifts leftwards. Now, the equilibrium quantity then falls. So output supplied when costs are higher because of a shift in the supply curve, remember, a change in the costs of inputs, an increase in the costs of inputs, an increase in production costs is what results in a shift of the supply curve. Not a movement along the supply curve, but a shift. And that is exactly what we are seeing here. 
And because we are seeing that shift, what happens is that output decreases from Q subscript zero to Q subscript and apostrophe zero. Now we move from looking at the level of firm output to entire market output. So each firm is now producing less of a given quantity of a good. So the result is that the supply curve after tax, note that's market output and not the output on the individual firm, that the supply tax, the supply curve after taxes for the entire market also shifts leftwards. And of course, this will have an impact on the equilibrium quantity in the market. And that is what we will analyze in the next slide. So what is it that happens when we impose a tax on producers? Well, because producers now face a higher cost, what we have is we have a leftward shift in the supply curve. Imagine that initially the price that was paid before the tax was $1. Now, what happens is that after tax, consumers have to pay $1.05. However, because the producer is taxed, what happens is we subtract 10 cents from that $1.05. The result is that the price received by firms after tax is 95 cents. Therefore, consumers pay a higher price, $1.05, and producers receive a lower price than the absence of a tax, which was 10 cents. So each loses 5 cents. This is lower than the initial price. Now, what happens if we impose a tax on consumers? Does it make a difference? Who is it that bears the burden? Well, let's look at the other way around. So imagine we impose a 10 cent tax and we start with the initial price of P subscript zero. The result of an imposition of this tax is that the demand curve shifts downwards. Okay. So the new equilibrium price is P subscript one. Now, what is it that happens? Well, we add another 10 cents onto that price. So this is the price with the taxes. So the producer receives a price of P subscript one, which is below the initial price, below the initial equilibrium price that was charged in the absence of a tax, yet the consumer pays a higher price, which is P subscript one plus T. So they pay this price now. So again, what we see is that makes no difference. The consumer pays a higher price, the producer receives a lower price. In other words, what happens is that a producer sells a bottle of beer, a P subscript one, we add 10 cents onto it, and the purchaser or the consumer pays P one plus T, which includes the tax. So there's no difference as to whether government imposes the tax on the producers of beer or the consumers of beer. Now let's extend this uh, framework a little bit further. So uh, what we assumed is that a specific tax was being levied. Now what a specific tax is, a specific tax is a fixed amount per unit of output. And what we saw is that that is associated with a shift in either the demand curve or the supply curve, depending upon who the tax is being levied. What if we impose a so-called ad valorem tax? And an ad valorem tax is levied as a given percentage of the price. So that means that the tax will differ with the price. So at higher prices, the tax will be higher. At lower prices, the tax will be lower. You can still think of the demand curve being shifted downwards. So this is what we see here except the amount that it shifts by differs because the price differs. And hence, if we have a fixed percentage, the amount of tax that is charged differs. As you can see at this point here, both demand curves are equal. Why? Because the price is zero. There is no tax that is paid. However, our original demand curve differs from our new demand curve after the imposition of an ad valorem tax. But the difference or the distance between the two narrows as we head towards a price of zero. And that is because the amount of the tax charged differs because of a difference in price along the demand curve. Now, let's assume that the new equilibrium is E subscript one after we impose either a specific tax or an ad valorem tax. So this is a situation we face if we impose a specific tax.
And this is the situation that we face if we impose an ad valorem tax. And specifically, we assume that it is imposed on the consumer in this instance, and that's why the demand curve is shifted. Well, assuming that where the two curves intersect each other, or the two curves will intersect each other, at the point where both taxes are equal. In other words, the percentage of the price is equal in cents to the specific tax that is being charged. And that situation corresponds to that statement here. So in summary, the incidence of a tax describes who actually bears the tax. It does not depend on who writes the check. So in the first instance, it was the producer that wrote the check. In the second instance, it was the consumer that wrote the check. In both instances, both would now be faced with a different price that they would either have to receive or that they would pay because of the tax. So there's a distortion there. It makes no difference, therefore, whether tax is levied on producers or consumers. In a competitive market, the incidences of an ad valorem tax and an equivalent specific tax are identical. Remember, that applies at the equilibrium condition, as we saw on the previous slide, because at equilibrium, the prices are the same. So hence, what will happen is that we will have identical incidences. If the tax incidence is not dependent upon whether tax is levied on consumers and producers, what is it that it depends on? Well, it depends upon the slope of the demand and supply curves. In other words, the shape it is as it is defined here. Specifically, let's look at situation panel A where we have a perfectly elastic supply curve. What a perfectly elastic supply curve means is that a very small change in the price level will result in an almost infinite change in the quantity supplied. In other words, the quantity supplied is very responsive to changes in the price level. The result is, well, how we represent this is that we have horizontal supply curves. So this is our initial situation or where we start off with, where we are paying a price of P subscript zero. That corresponds to a quantity of Q subscript zero, where equilibrium is, as before, determined by the intersection of the demand and supply curves. Now, the imposition of a tax on, let's say, the suppliers results in an upward, specifically a leftward shift, but we we'll present this as an upward shift now of the supply curve. We arrive at a new equilibrium, E subscript 1. So this is the new price that is now paid for beer by, supplier, by, the, by consumers. So for each bottle of beer that a consumer purchases, they pay a price of P subscript 1. From that price, we subtract the tax, and that is what the producer receives. So the producer keep, carries on receiving P subscript zero, in other words, the same price that was received before the tax was imposed, and the quantity that is now the equilibrium quantity is lower, it is Q subscript one, and we have a new equilibrium point here. So in terms of the price that supplies received, that does not change, but consumers now pay a higher price, higher by the amount of the tax. So the entire burden of the tax is borne by the consumer now. Alternatively, let's look at panel B. So in panel B, what we have is a perfectly inelastic demand curve. In other words, regardless of how the price changes, the quantity demanded will not change. So that is why we see a vertical demand curve. The quantity demanded does not respond to price changes. So now let's say that we again impose a tax. Uh, and this is our equilibrium quantity. We impose this tax on suppliers, and the result is that we have a leftward shift of the supply curve. The initial price is P subscript zero. Now the new price is P subscript one. So consumers pay P subscript one. From that, we deduct a tax. And what happens is that that is what producers then receive. So that deduction equates the amount that is received by producers to P subscript zero. So consumers pay a higher price, they pay P subscript one, but producers still receive the same price. So hence, again, the entire burden of the tax is on consumers. They pay more, but producers still receive the same amount. 
So, in summary, the elasticity of demand gives a percentage change in the quantity of the good consumed due to a change in the price. And the elasticity of supply gives the quantity uh, percentage change in the quantity of a good supply due to ch a change in its price. If something is elastic, that means that there is a large response to the price or changes in price. If it is inelastic, then quantity does not respond to changes in price. So that is a recap and a bit of a summary of this discussion of elasticity. Now let's look at a situation where we have a completely inelastic supply curve and a completely elastic demand curve. So what does a perfectly inelastic supply curve imply? Well, it implies that the supply curve is vertical. Regardless of what happens to the price, there is no change in the quantity supplied. Thinking of it the other way, well, what happens if we increase the costs of production? Well, the supply curve would shift upwards. Well, here the supply curve doesn't shift anywhere, or well, it does shift upwards, but it still remains vertical. So there is no real movement of the supply curve as such. So what is it that happens if we impose a tax? Well, the full burden of the tax is then on producers. Producers carry on charging a price of P subscript zero, which is equal to P price P subscript one, which includes the tax. Our equilibrium point does not change. In panel B, what we see is a perfectly inelastic demand curve. In other words, demand or the quantity demanded does not respond at all to changes in the price level. Now, let's say we impose another tax on suppliers. Again, the costs of production increase. We have a leftward shift of the supply curve. Note our initial equilibrium is, that, is at this point here, which corresponds to an equilibrium price of P subscript zero. Once we have a shift in the supply curve, which reflects the tax, our new equilibrium is at this point here, and our new price is P subscript 1. The core equilibrium quantity is lower, but there is no change in the price that is paid by the consumers or that is now received by the producers. Yet the producers need to pay a tax. So they are worse off. So the entire burden of the tax is now on producers. Let's look at this problem from a labor perspective or this uh, issue of tax incidence from labor perspective. So here what we have is we have a demand curve for labor, in other words, employers. And here what we have is we have a supply curve, in other words, the providers of labor, which are workers. As you can see, the supply curve is upward sloping. So as the wage increases, in other words, the price of labor increases, employees are willing to supply more labor, a greater quantity of labor. Let's say that we have a tax that is charged on uh, employers, in other words, a social security tax now, in other words, they have to pay a certain amount towards social security tax. And let's assume that this is the initial equilibrium wage. Well, what happens if we impose a social security tax on employers? Well, we have a downward shift in the demand curve. So hence, what happens is that the equilibrium wage is lower for workers. Alternatively, because of this tax, what happens is that the firms now have to pay a higher wage rate. So this is the wage rate that they pay, and this is the wage rate that uh, employees receive as a result of the higher taxes. Remember, the idea is when we introduce a tax, both will be affected, and this is exactly what we are seeing here. We're seeing a tax incidence falling equally on both the uh, employer and also the employee, regardless of who it is that pays it. So that is how we could analyze the impact of social security payments, that employers will now be faced with higher costs and employees will now receive a lower wage as a result. And hence, both bear the incidence of these new taxes. In panel B, we have an interesting situation. So there's a belief among some economists that the labor uh, supply curve is backward bending or backward sloping. The result is, or what this implies, is that as we work beyond a certain point, what happens is that the quantity of labor supplied diminishes. Reason why is people have enough money, so they want to enjoy leisure, so they start substituting labor for leisure. They have more leisure, they work less. So that is what we see 
from this point onwards, that the quantity supplied falls. Now, let's say we impose a social security tax. Again, what is it that happens? Well, the demand curve shifts to the left. So, because now our firms have to pay more pay employee because of additional social security tax, they hire less labor. What is the result of that? Well, the initial result of that is a drop in the wage that is earned by employees and uh, a higher cost per employee that is faced now by the firms. However, because we are dealing with a backward bending uh, supply curve, labor supply curve specifically, what this implies is that the lower wage now spurs on a greater quantity of labor to be supplied. So we go from this equilibrium point, note that corresponds to a lower equilibrium level of quantity, to a higher level of uh, labor being high in equilibrium, which corresponds to this point or this quantity of labor. So what we are seeing is that a tax on labor may result in a reduction in the wage rate, and that is exactly what we see here. However, in this instance, that reduction in the wage rate is greater than tax itself, as the decrease in wages induces a larger labor supply, which drives down the wage further. Let's look at it from a slightly different perspective. So let's say that we have a small country and this small country wants to uh, uh, take on uh, capital, it wants to borrow and on that capital, it has to pay interest. So it takes that capital, the price that is given because it is a small country and can't impact capital markets. So the, here is our initial equilibrium corresponding to this equilibrium quantity of capital. As you can see, we have a horizontal supply curve. Why? Because we assume that uh, capital is highly elastic. Now, let's say we impose a tax on capital. The result is that there's a downward shift in the demand curve for uh, capital and the price of capital. In other words, the interest does not change. So hence, those that supply the capital are still receiving an interest of I. However, those that are using that capital have to pay that interest plus a tax. And this is the price of that capital now. It is higher than that price at which it is supplied initially. So the equilibrium quantity of capital is lower and who bears the burden of these taxes are capital users because now they have to pay a tax on the capital that they borrow. So what happens in the absence of perfect competition? Specifically, what happens if we tax a monopoly? Well, the monopolist maximizes profits by producing at the point where the marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. That corresponds to this point of the demand curve, which is equal to price P subscript zero. And so that is the profit maximizing price and um, Q subscript zero, which is the profit maximizing quantity. Now, if we impose a tax on the production of aluminium, what happens is that the marginal cost curve shifts upwards the price that maximizes profits increases and the quantity that maximizes profits decreases. So what we see is a reduction output and an increase in the price of aluminium following the imposition of a tax. So the tax here can be seen as simply as an increase in production of cost which is then passed on to prices that would need to be paid for by the consumers. Thus far, what we've been speaking about are so-called wage taxes. So what happens if we tax wages? How does that impact how much we can afford? Well, what happens if we begin to tax consumption? So assume that an individual has a certain amount of money to spend throughout a first period, let's say their first 40 years of their life, and then another amount of money to spend on consumption in the second period of their life. So they receive a certain amount of money in the first half of their life and then another amount of money in the second half of their life. Well, these are the extremes that can be spent on consumption in only a single period, either the second period or the first period or the other way around. Now, let's say that we tax their wages. Let's say we impose a 20% tax.
Well, the result is that in both periods, they will be able to consume less. Why? Because their income is lower. We take away a part of their income. Now, what happens if we don't tax their income, but instead tax their consumption? So we tax everything that they consume by 20%. We call that a 20% consumption tax. The result is that the effect is the same. In both end periods, the consumer is able to consume less, and that is why the level of consumption falls, regardless of whether we impose a wage or a consumption tax. So the trade-off between spending today and uh, tomorrow or in any um, any or in any combinations between the two periods remains unchanged if we tax other consumption or wages. What are the, some of the other factors that impact uh, tax incidents? Well, we need to delve a little bit further. So what we've done is we've undertaken or what we assume is a partial equilibrium analysis. That's the starting point for understanding how else this impact can fall and what impacts tax incidents. So assume that we impose a tax on the beer industry. What will happen? Prices will go up, demand, the quantity demanded will fall, some people lose jobs as a result, but we assume that this will not have an impact on prices and wages. Why? Because lose, those that lose jobs, we assume, will be able to easily find another job. And hence, there will not be a downward pressure on wages, which occurs when there is an increase in unemployment. However, the situation is not simple. Taxes don't only impact one industry, they impact a number of industries. So for example, corporate income taxes impact all incorporated businesses, so all corp. So because all incorporate businesses are paying taxes, in other words, all corporates or firms are paying taxes, what happens is there's a reduction in the demand for capital. Um, and we assume that this reduction cannot be absorbed by the rest of the economy without reducing the return to capital. In other words, uh, they need less money, they need less funding, and hence the return that is offered now is lower because the demand for capital is lower. So what we now need to do is we need to now analyze the impact of a corporate tax on the entire equilibrium of the economy or the equilibrium of the entire economy and not just a business or an industry upon which that the tax is imposed. So we go from a partial equilibrium analysis to something called a general equilibrium analysis in this case. So what general equilibrium analysis suggests is that all these effects of taxes are throughout the economy. Then what we also have is, in addition to that, is we have this idea of short-run, long-run effects. It might be that not much changes following the imposition of a tax in the short run. But on the other hand, in the long run, the situation might be very different. Let's use an example where you invest in one industry and you expect a return. But all of a sudden, the government decides to start taxing that investment. And hence, it no longer makes sense to invest in the industry because now you have to pay taxes on any return you earn. Whereas there's other industries where you don't pay taxes or you pay much lower taxes uh, for anything that uh, comes back in returns. Now, in the short run, we assume that it's difficult to remove one's funds and shift them to another industry. So hence, you cannot really do much in the short run. On the other hand, what happens is in the long run, you can shift funds away from that industry for which the returns are now being taxed. So hence, the impact is very different in the long run and the short run. The reason why we worry about a distinction between the short run and the long run is because policymakers often don't consider the long run. They only focus on the short run. In other words, they don't really see the unintended wrong uh, uh, consequences of imposing taxes. They only observe an immediate effect without realizing the full consequences. Now, these consequences may not have been those as intended. Then there is the issue of a, to the political process. When one changes government policy, it is only a change at a time, a single change at a time. What this means is that when government imposes a tax, it might need to lower tax in another industry, uh, reduce its borrowing or increase its expenditures. The point is there's different combinations of policies and these different combinations will have different effects.
So, for example, there's a differential tax incidence analysis, and this implies that one tax is substituted for another, resulting in revenues being unchanged. There's also balanced budget tax incidence analysis. So this implies that we change expenditure as tax revenues change. We can also have balanced growth incidence analysis, and this suggests that some economists are interested in analyzing combinations of policies that leave some important economic variable unchanged. So, for example, many taxes have an impact on the level of capital accumulation. Uh, the problem is that if capital falls, if there's a fall in capital stock, this in turn lowers wages. So what one might to do, want to do is they might want to distinguish the direct effect from the indirect effects of a tax resulting from its impact on capital accumulation. So what does the incidence of taxes in the U.S. look like? Well, in the U.S. there's a progressive tax system. What this implies is that you're supposed to pay more if you earn more. However, the general consensus is that the U.S. tax system is far less progressive than the official tax code might suggest. In other words, it is a nice idea that the rich might pay more than those that are poor. However, this does not seem to be the case. So it might even be regressive in reality. In other words, that the poor might be land up paying more taxes or share a higher burden of the tax than the rich do. What are the reasons for this view? Specifically, that the US tax system is not as progressive as it is suggested by the tax codes. First of all, it has certain design features that allow certain types of income or categories of individuals to escape taxation, at the very least partially that is. So for example, individuals can put away savings in tax exempt accounts. Um, and hence, since the richer are more likely to have savings, they tend to use this opportunity more than poor individuals. So hence the poor don't really benefit from uh, the, the from uh, these measures that allow them to avoid certain taxation. Also, income tax is only one type of tax. There's many other taxes. There's also state and local taxes. And these are less progressive. In other words, they are not as tied to the amount you earn. Um, and even sometimes regressive, that those that are poor end up paying more in taxes. Then finally, we propose that if we impose a social security tax, both employers and employees will bear the tax. But the evidence is different in reality. So the incidences of many taxes differs from what is suggested by the tax codes to what is, uh, in other words, in what is pro proposed by the tax codes. Specifically, economists see that social security taxes are not really born by both the employer and employee. Instead, they are mostly borne by the employee.